Hey guys, I know it's been a while, but I am finally back with another video. I say that every single time I'm gone for a long period of time, but I really am going to do better this month, I promise. <laughs> so September is NICU Awareness Month, so I thought this would be the perfect time for me to bring back my NICU series. A lot of people have said that they liked it, that it's helped them, and that they want me to do another one. So here we go. What better time than NICU Awareness Month? So NICU Awareness Month is all about honoring families who have a baby in the NICU and all the healthcare professionals who take care of those babies. So I'm really excited for this month and every single week I am planning on posting a NICU specific video. And also what I want to do towards the end of the month is have maybe my last video be a Q&A all about the NICU. But um, if you have questions regarding nursing in general too, you can ask me those questions. So be sure to leave your questions down in the comments section below. Also, I want to post on my Instagram story, um, you know how they let you put questions in there and we can answer them? Um, I will post something about um, NICU specific questions, so if you follow me on Instagram, you can just ask me a question on there. Um, I've noticed a lot of people will DM me on Instagram and ask me their questions, so obviously everyone can't see it if it's just a DM between me and one person, so I will go back and look through those old DMs and try to gather all those questions that I've gotten asked over the last few months or years. And I will put that together in my Q&A video. So I'm really excited about this NICU series part 2. And as you can see, I am wearing my scrubs today. I had a NRP renewal class today. So usually the class is a few hours, but because of the pandemic and everything going on, it was literally like one hour and we didn't really do too much. So I want to talk about NRP a little bit for my NICU series, but then I realized I kind of already talked about it in a video um, where I talked about all the classes and certifications that you need as a NICU nurse. Um, so I'll put the link down to that video below and I'll put the timestamp on it also where I talk about NRP so you guys can learn a little bit more about that. But for today, I want to talk about my care times and my head to toe assessment as a NICU nurse. So in my video where I talk about, um, well it's titled So You Want to Be a NICU Nurse, I briefly touched on care times and also my video where I talk about my typical shift as a NICU nurse, but I really didn't go into detail about what I do during one care time or like one head to toe assessment. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. All right, so in the NICU we have what we call care times and we do clustered care. So that means we do everything all at once so that we're not bothering the baby constantly, you know, constantly waking them up because it's very important for these babies to get as much rest as possible and as little stimulation as possible. So typically we do our care times about every three hours. If a patient is NPO or has continuous feeds, we do their care times every four hours. Now if a patient is PO at lip, that means they can eat whenever they want to. So let's say they wake up every two hours, that's kind of when we will do our care times for them every two hours. But um, let's say you feed a baby and then like an hour later they wake up. You don't really have to do the full care time. It's more just maybe change a diaper and maybe, you know, you can check the temperature. But you don't really have to if they're not going past that three hour mark. And so during care times, if parents are present, we of course want them to participate. So we have them um, check their temperature, change a diaper, hold them, feed them, stuff like that. And we kind of just walk them through the process. So when I do my care times, I like to pretty much do my vitals first. So, and just everything that I need to do, like changing diapers, check temperature, check girth, um, stuff like that. I like to get that out of the way first. And then I do my full, real head to toe assessment. So let's just talk about the order of how I like to do what I do. So if a patient is in an isolate or a radiant warmer, we do have to document the temperature. Um, but if they're in a crib, obviously there's not gonna be a temp probe attached to them, so you don't have to worry about that. So let's say, I have a patient that is under the radiant warmer. So I pay attention to the temperature on the radiant warmer and I make a note of that so I can document it later. And then I like to attach my blood pressure cuff to the patient's leg and do a blood pressure first because if I don't do the blood pressure first, let's say I wake up the patient and then they're screaming and crying and you're going to get a terrible inaccurate blood pressure. So. I like to do that first very gently and you know, you gotta be kind of sneaky with it so that you don't upset the baby. So once I get my blood pressure, I like to switch out the pulse ox. So we switch out our pulse oxes on our patients about every six hours because there's like a little light on it and if you leave it on too long, it can, you know, damage your skin, maybe leave like a little burn. So we have to make sure that we're rotating that site and also, you know, it's wrapped around, you know, their foot or maybe their hand. So you want to give that hand or that foot a little break. So every six hours we switch, we switch that. So once I do that, next I like to check my patient's temperature. 
so once they have a good temperature. Next, I like to move on to the abdominal girth. So you just take your little measuring tape and you measure around their belly. So it's really important to measure the abdominal girth. We also do that every six hours. So um, that's like every other care time because like I said, care times are typically every three hours. So with the girth, you wanna make sure that it is not going up too much. So if it's like over one and a half centimeters larger than what it was before, you have to make sure I notify the provider because that can be um, a sign that something bad is going on. After my girth, I like to move on and change my patient's diaper. So, you know, obviously, you know how to change a diaper. Do that. Um, and it's very important that you pay attention to the urine, like the color. Is it yellow and straw, which is normal, or is it like a darker amber color? Also, if they poop, we want to make sure we pay attention to what kind of poop it is. So, is it small? Is it medium? Large? Is it loose? Seedy? Soft? Meconium? Brown? Yellow? <sighs> you know, you just really have to get into the descriptions and document everything. So, pay attention in case something weird is going on. A patient may also have a Foley and like a little Buretrol. So, you have the urine in the container, you let the urine out, you measure how much is in there. You also have to pay attention to what it looks like. Is it clear? Is it cloudy? Are there sediments and little stones floating around in it? So pay attention to all the details. But also you want to look at their genitalia. Um, is there swelling? Is it normal? Are they circumcised, uncircumcised? Um, do they have like um, anything weird going on there? This is also the time that I like to pay attention to the other vitals. So their oxygen saturation. Um, typically for a pretty stable baby, we want, we want their oxygen saturation to be between about 91 to 95. Um, if it's a cardiac patient, then they may have lower sets um, for their O2 sets. So they may be allowed to be between 75 and 85%. But let's say we have a pretty stable baby with no cardiac issues. We want it to be between about 91 and 95, especially if they're on oxygen, because they can get what's called ROP, and if you give them too much oxygen, it can damage their eyes. So you want to make sure it's between 91 and 95. But if the patient is breathing room air, like I am doing right now, it's okay for the O2 sets to be up to 100%. I also want to pay attention to the respiratory rate. So is my patient tachypnic? Like, are they just sitting, you know, breathing 80 to 100 breaths per minute? Um, typically. Um, what I learned in nursing school is we want their respiratory rate to be between about 30 to 60. However, where I work, we're fine with it being the 20s, um, but if it's above 60, we say they are tachypnic. Also, you're going to see on the monitor their heart rate, so pay attention to that. Are they um, tachycardic, so it's a heart rate like 190s, 200s, that's you know not something we want. We want it to be typically between 110 and 160. Um, however, some babies will have a low resting heart rate if that's just them. Um, sometimes the providers will say, oh, it's okay, that's their baseline. It's okay for it to be in the high 90s. Um, or maybe you have a patient that's on a cooling blanket, so of course their heart rate is going to be a little bit lower. So pay attention to that and pay attention to the rhythm because um, it can be a funky little rhythm. So you want to notify the provider if it's not the normal sinus rhythm. Alright, so once I am done with my vitals and like changing the diaper, checking the girth, moving the pulse hawks, that kind of stuff, then I can move on to my full head to toe assessment. So I actually kind of like to go in the order of the head to toe. It really doesn't always go out that way. Sometimes I may start in a different part of the body, but um, it's easier to remember and to not forget things if you actually go from head to toe. So starting with the head. First, I want to check out their fontanelles and sutures. As far as the fontanelles, we want to check to see if it's flat and soft or if it's full and bulging. So they're going to have their anterior and their posterior. And then you're going to check for sutures. Are their sutures overriding? Are they widened? Um, so then moving on to the face, you want to see is their face symmetrical? Um, do they have some weird features going on? So for example, if you have a trisomy 21 kid, Let's see, um, do you want to you want to pay attention to see if they have those typical trisomy 21 features, so like low set ears, a widened nose and nasal bridge, um, almond shaped eyes. So you want to pay attention to everything they've got going on. So next after that, I like to move on to the abdomen and chest. 
So this is when I like to auscultate. So I will listen to the heart sounds. Um, is there that regular S1, S2 lub dub sound? Or am I hearing like a whoosh, 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 which is a murmur? So my camera decided to overheat and cut off on me. So back to what I was saying. So after my heart sounds, I like to move on to the lung sounds. So you want to listen to see if your patient's breath sounds are clear or if they're, um, you're hearing ronchi, wheezing, strider, crackles, all that. Then I like to listen to the bowel sounds and see if they are active, hypoactive, hyperactive. And then um, while you're on the chest and abdomen, of course you want to look for work of breathing. So are they retracting a lot? Are they subcostal, intercostal, supraclavicular, or any of that? You want to pay attention to that, obviously. Also, when it comes to the belly, you want to fill it, um, so palpate, and you want to see if it is soft, if it's firm, distended, rounded, are there visible bowel loops, and obviously you want to look at their arms, legs, hands, and feet. Have you, do you notice some acrocyanosis, um, which is pretty common and normal. Also, you want to check their cap refill. We want it to usually be less than three seconds. Um, you want to look at their skin. Is it dry, flaky, warm, cool? Do you see any hemangiomas or um, maybe scratches, abrasions, um, Mongolian spots? Just anything you want to check it out. Also with musculoskeletal, um, is there limited movement or are they moving just fine? Do you see extra digits on their fingers or their feet? Um, what else can I say? You can also check out their pulses, like their brachial pulse, radial pulse, femoral, stuff like that. You want it to be plus two, obviously. Also with skin, that I forgot to mention, um, you obviously want to check for a breakdown. So each care time, we want to reposition our patient. You never want to leave them in the same position because that can lead to pressure sores. So um, you want to check out for that. Um, and also the diaper area, you want to look for a rash or any breakdown. Even on their necks, they tend to get like little rashes. And so obviously your care time can go a little bit different if your patient has, you know, some crazy condition going on. Um, as far as respiratory, if your patient is on bubble CPAP, you're going to have to take their hat off every care time and massage their head and ears and look for redness on their nose and their forehead. Um, maybe your patient has an ostomy, so you're going to, if their bag is leaking, that's when you'll replace it during your care time. Um, if they have, let's say your patient went down for an x lap and they have sutures, maybe they started to dehiss or something, so now you have to do site care and maybe change their dressing. Maybe your patient has a Brovac and you have to change that dressing. So you do all this stuff during your care times. Also if your patient needs a bath, during your care time. Uh, if your patient has a PIV, you're going to check that. Um, not just during your care time. So PIVs, if they're infusing, we do want to check it every hour. But if it's saline locked, you just flush it and check it during your care times. Your patient may have a UAC or a UVC. Obviously, you want to make sure it's still in the correct place. Um, maybe they have an ET tube. That's when you're going to do your suctioning. Um, also, you always want to do oral care um, during your care times. So suction out their mouth, their nose. Also, a lot of our patients have feeding tubes because they cannot eat on their own. Um, so this is when you're going to run and check their residual um, also during the care time, obviously. So if the residual is something like a crazy color, like um, green and bilious, obviously notify the provider. Um, but we usually want it to be just your regular whitish yellow partially digested milk. You want to um, maybe retape their tube if their mouth gets really slobbery and the tube is starting to come out you do that. Um, so that is basically your care time and your head to toe assessment. You literally just do everything all during the care time so that you're not having to wake them up every 30 minutes to an hour. So you want to do your vitals, check literally everything head to toe, and feed them if they're being fed. And so obviously after your care time and your head to toe assessment, you're going to do your charting, which is a whole nother video on its own. And I can't stress enough, if you notice something really weird or just off about your patient during your assessment, notify the provider. It could be normal or like their baseline, but still notify the provider and they will usually come to the bedside to check it out or they'll give you some new orders. Um, but the whole point of the assessment is to make sure everything is okay and to find if something is not okay 
and let the doctors know so that you can do something about it. Okay guys, that is pretty much it. It's just a general overview of what a care time looks like for me and my head to toe assessment. Obviously, I can't name everything because each patient may have something different going on which requires something that they may get but another patient may not get during their care time. But I just wanted to give you a general overview of what we look for during our head to toe assessment. And obviously some things are going to vary depending on the hospital or the patient. But that is pretty much it in a nutshell. Literally you're going to check from the head to the toe and you're going to do your vitals and change diapers and just anything that patient needs during your care time, get it done during the care time so you're not having to do anything in between those three to four hours um, in between care times. Now obviously if your patient is braiding or having a DSAT, throwing up or something like that, then yes, you're going to intervene in between those care times, but you don't want to bother them too much in between. So I hope you guys found this video helpful. Don't forget to leave your NICU questions down in the comment section below so that I can do my Q&A at the end of the month and answer all of your questions. And I hope you all have a lovely day. Bye!